Let me mention once again, for those of you who uh, just came in a few minutes ago, down at the front, you'll see there are a bunch of beautiful vases, vases, with flowers, roses, and uh, baby breath in them. Beautiful uh, ribbons tying each one of them up. Those are for the ladies here. And um, we'll give the mothers first choice. Those who are mothers may have their first choice of those. And then any who are left are for the other ladies who are here today. And so you are welcome to take those. We thank Kathy Wu. She <coughs> stayed up late cutting flowers and putting them into the vases and uh, preparing those for you as a happy Mother's Day present. So as soon as the morning worship is over, don't rush up here right now, but as soon as it's over, you're welcome to come down to the front and take one for yourself and for your home to remember the joy of motherhood. And today the message is entitled, A Joyful Mother of Children. We read that passage just a moment ago. Now in the past, I have spoken on the agony of motherhood, but this year I want to talk about the joy of motherhood. But there has to be a mention of the pain first. Far away, in a small town cemetery in rural Alabama, is a burial site topped with a granite headstone. And those are the words that are written upon it. A joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. Under the words are the names of 13 children eight sons and five daughters. Part of my life and my heart are buried there as well. Of course, you know, I speak of Judy's grave, which lies next to the place where someday I will be buried if the Lord Jesus tarries. Next to that grave, on the left is the grave of another woman. On that stone are engraved the words, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That woman was my mother-in-law, whom many of you knew. Yes, graves are a reminder of death, but they should also be a reminder of intergenerational life and of the grace of God. For by grace are ye saved through faith. The grace of God as he kindly teaches each generation that there were mothers who gave them life. Mothers who nurtured them, who raised them to be men and women, who loved them, who sacrificed for them, who prayed for them, who cried with them and for them, who set the example for them, who walked with them, who li listened to them, who witnessed to them, who taught them, who read the Bible to them, who patiently helped them through each little crisis, who watched them grow, and who, with joy, sent them into the world to carry the name of Christ to the next generation. A joyful mother of children Praise ye the Lord. The joyful mother of children is indeed a reason to praise the Lord. God is the one who made the first mother. God is the one who established the first family. God is the one who said it is not good for man to be alone. You all know that Judy was a very skilled and talented woman. 
She had many earned degrees, which she had received with top honors. She was gifted in many fields, as in language and music and art and teaching. But if you ask her what she thought her primary role should be, she would always reply, a wife and mother. She fulfilled that role with incredible patience and tenacity. Those of you who are mothers know that it's not easy to be the mother of one or two children, but the logistics compound exponentially when you're the mother of 13 children of multiple ages, multiple gifts and abilities, different needs and temperaments, which can simultaneously melt down into total chaos in a chain reaction similar to a nuclear explosion. <laughs> what a skill to still be a joyful mother of children when the world of little people is falling apart around you. Without question, the central role that God gave to Judy was that she was to be a mother who raised children, who sent them out into the world to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. She homeschooled all of them through birth, from birth through 12th grade, and then joined me as we prayerfully sent them off to Pensacola Christian College to train for the vocations to which God had called each of them. But they did not go unprepared. She, the joyful mother of children, had given to each of them the essential foundation that they would need to face the challenges of life. The day came when we said our tearful but joyful goodbyes to our youngest as she headed off to Pensacola. Megaly, our youngest child, had just completed her first semester of college and was in her second semester when Jesus reached down and took Judy's hand. Come home, dear Judy. You finished the life work that I gave you to do. Your life work was the children I entrusted to your care. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. You did your life work with joy. You were indeed a joyful mother of children. You never complained about it. You never resisted it. You never tried to prevent it through birth control. You never scorned it. You never thought that something else was more important. You never worried about how your own health or body would be affected by it. You wanted as many children as I would give you. You lost one little one whom I took home in the womb and who was delighted to meet you when you stepped into my presence. You looked at motherhood as a joyful privilege and honor. You believed my word that motherhood was a blessing and not a curse. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Yes, Judy exemplified Psalm 113.9. She set the example for all of you women, both young and old, as to what it means to be a godly woman. Proverbs 31 
gives the character qualities of the godly woman. If you examine it closely, you discover that all of her activities, even her economic activities, center around the home. The last few verses of that chapter end with these words. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful. Beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. Did you hear it? Household, children, husband. It's clear where her focus is. And God himself gives the summary of such a woman in verse 30. A woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Such a woman is the joyful mother of children, a woman who fears the Lord. She doesn't fear for her own health. She doesn't fear that she'll lose her own pleasure. She does not fear that she will lose her own accumulation of wealth. She does not fear for her own comfort, her own peace, her own prosperity, her own leisure time, her own convenience, her own figure, her own skin texture with no birthing stretch marks, her own reputation among other petty women who criticize her and gossip behind her back while they sip their Starbucks coffee and waste their husband's money. She does not fear about losing her own selfish time. She does not pout about her own, I would rather be doing such and such, instead of changing diapers. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, think about that. How many diapers does a mom have to change on average if she has 13 children who are in diapers for at least two years? and she has to change 10 to 15 diapers per child every day. You know, we used to use homemade cloth diapers because we were poor. We couldn't afford disposable diapers. And Judy had to first wash out those diapers in the toilet by hand before putting them into the washing machine. And then in later life, she had to change the diapers of her mother for almost 10 years. And this was a woman who had three advanced earned degrees with honors beyond her bachelor's degree, which she also had earned with honors at the top of her class. And believe it or not, she counted it all joy. She was a joyful mother because it was service for Christ. Think about how many meals she had to cook from the time the first child was born, just 11 months after we were married, to the time the last one went off to college. The oldest one is 21 years older than the youngest one. 40 years of fixing meals how many loads of laundry does she have to do for 15 people all those years? And when her mother lived with us for 16 people? You know something? I never once remember hearing her complain about the job God gave her to do. Not once. Some ladies I know complain all the time about the most trivial inconveniences. Now, maybe some of you are saying, now, why are you preaching a sermon that has so much about Judy in it? <laughs> because the Bible commands it. Because the Bible says, she shall be praised. 
Maybe you don't like to hear the praise because it shines light on dirty laundry. But that raises the question, why should such a woman be praised? And the answer is, because God wants young women, especially, to sit up and take notice of what pleases him. Perhaps only once in a generation in any particular location, God will place such a woman so that other young Christian women will have a living example of what it means to be a godly woman who is a joyful mother of children. It doesn't happen often. But I think at least once in every generation, in every location, God gives you at least one example. Ladies, God gave Judy to you as an example in this time, at this place, and in this generation. That doesn't denigrate those of you who've never had the privilege of marriage, or those to whom God in his wisdom has gently restricted from having children. But today is Mother's Day, and so we're talking about mothers. Whether married or single, forget your pride. Forget feeling sorry for yourself. Develop the character qualities that God says are the character qualities he wants to see in Proverbs 31, even if you're not married and don't have children. A woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Learn God's perspective on what is valuable, what is excellent, what is praiseworthy, and it will cause you to stand in awe of the godly woman. Study the life and the character of such a woman. Joy is central to the character of such a woman. A joyful mother of children. Forget your own petty worldly goals and your trivial focus on things of earth. All of those things will die, rot, and pass away when we die, rot, and pass away. Focus on eternity. Focus on the will of God. Do you know how often the Bible speaks of those earthly things passing away? Let me give you just a sample. This is just a few. All the things that we focus on, welfare and health and money and time and the like, they all pass away. Job 30, 15, terrors are turned upon me. They pursue my soul as the wind, and my welfare passeth away as a cloud. Psalm 78, 39, for he remembereth that they were but flesh, a wind that passeth away and cometh not again. Psalm 144, 4, man is like the vanity. His days are as a shadow that passeth away. Ecclesiastes 1 4, one generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. Isaiah 29 5. Moreover, the multitude of thy strangers shall be like this small dust, and the multitude of thy terrible ones shall be as chaff that passes away. Yea, it shall be an instant suddenly. Jeremiah 13 24. Therefore will I scatter them as a stubble that passeth away by the wind of the wilderness. Hosea 13.3 Therefore they shall be as the morning cloud and as the early dew that passeth away, as the chaff that is driven with the whirlwind out of the floor, and as a smoke out of the chimney. 1 Corinthians 7.31 And they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. 1 John 2.17 And the world passeth away and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Take your focus off earth. Children, are the only thing you can take with you to heaven. Your bank account is temporal. Your house is temporal. Your car is temporal. 
your junk is temporal. Don't focus there. Children are eternal. It was the Lord himself that said, Children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. A heritage means an inheritance. Only an idiot would give up an inheritance that God says is infinitely valuable. God himself says that babies, the fruit of the womb, are a reward, not a curse. I hope you notice as I read through that psalm that verse 9, the final verse in the psalm, is the capstone of the psalm. This is one of the great psalms of praise to Jehovah. Let me read it again. It's short but powerful. Think about the joyful mother of children in this context. Praise ye the Lord. That phrase starts the psalm. That phrase ends the psalm. Praise ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun until the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like unto the Lord our God who dwelleth on high, who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven? He has to go down to look at heaven and on earth. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the needy out of the dunghill that he may set him with princes, even with the princes of his people. And then the capstone of the psalm. He maketh the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord! The first six verses out of nine are about the glory of the Lord who is to be praised. That's two-thirds of the psalm before it ever mentions anything about what he does for people. Then God speaks about raising up the poor, but he closes the psalm with the much more difficult situation of the barren woman, the impossible situation of the barren woman, being the mother not of only one child, but the joyful mother of children. The Lord Jesus also spoke of the joy of motherhood that makes a woman forget the agony of going through childbirth. And remember, this passage I'm about to read you is during the upper room discourse just before Jesus went to the cross. And he makes reference to joy in childbirth. Does that not seem odd to you that he would speak on that subject just before he is nailed to the cross? Listen to what he says. Now Jesus, this is John 16, beginning in verse 19. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him and said unto him, Do ye inquire among yourselves of that I said? A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again, a little while, and ye shall see me. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. And ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into, what's the next word? Joy. Remember, we're talking about a joyful mother of children. Your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. Yes, there is pain in giving birth. 
but it blossoms into joy. Jesus himself parallels this with the sorrow of the apostles of his own death, but the joy that they would have at his resurrection. Did you get it? The resurrection in this passage is set in perfect parallel to the joyful mother of children, the resurrection. That's awesome. On Resurrection Sunday, we thrill with joy about the resurrection of Christ. That's the foundation and ground of our salvation, our resurrection, and our bliss in heaven. And Paul himself says, without the resurrection of Christ, we are of all men most miserable. The birth pangs are real. They are terrible. Remember, here they're compared to the death of Christ by Jesus himself. Yes, they're fearful. They can last a long time. They produce panic and fear and exhaustion. There's bleeding and thirst and questioning about whether it was worth it or not. There's difficulty in breathing. Do you understand? That all goes with childbirth. Those are all things that happen to Jesus on the cross, every last one of them. There's intense sweat and trembling and chills. There's desperate communication with loved ones standing near. A mother going through labor. Yes, Jesus talking off the cross in his seven last words. There's agony and suffering that's real and tangible and palpable. There's stress on the heart, the muscles and the bones, on the woman as the pelvis stretches to make way for the child and as Jesus was pulled, bones pulled out of joint, as Psalm 16 speaks. There's a crisis of transition with the panning and blowing and pushing. There's severance and separation as the child is born. And then suddenly there is relief as the child takes his first breath, gives his first cry, and is placed on his mother's breast. Suddenly, there is joy and peace. Suddenly, there's no more memory of the pain of birth. There's a new, overwhelming focus. There is a new life that fills the room with joy and hope. There is a joyful mother of children. I know. I was there 13 times. If a dad is there at conception at the moment of pleasure, he should be there at the moment of birth, the time of greatest pain and stress that his dear wife will ever face. He should be there to hold her, to comfort her, to encourage her, to stand as her rock, to give her confident assurance that he loves her, to let her know that he doesn't think that she's fat, but that he thinks she's the most beautiful woman in the world, that he's thrilled that she's willing to go through the agony of Eden's curse so that they can have a child to let her know that he will not leave her, to massage her and ease her pain and adjust her pillows, to be there even when the midwife or the nurse has to leave because the doctors are certainly not there for 24 or 36 or 48 hours while she goes through labor and transition and delivery. Her husband gives her strength through the trial. He grips her hand tightly kisses her gently. He whispers tenderly in her ear as her hair is matted with thick sweat. He helps her sit up when the time of delivery is near and when the baby crowns. If they have a good midwife, he helps catch the baby and places it on top of his wife's abdomen and on his wife's breasts where the infant immediately begins to search for the nipple to suck. He helps cut the umbilical cord and deliver the placenta. And his wife is at peace if she's not been totally knocked out by mind-altering, body-debilitating drugs. Remember verse 21? The woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow because her hour is come. You can't stop it. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy 
that a man is born into the world. I know. I've done it all. In fact, as you know, just last week, my son Isaiah and his new bride visited us here at Bible Presbyterian Church. She is a delightful young woman, a medical doctor, who's doing her residency in obstetrics and gynecology. In the first few months of residency, she's already delivered or assisted in the delivery of several hundred babies. After church, I took them to dinner at the Olive Garden, so obviously in the course of our conversation, her delight in helping other moms give birth came up. After a while, I smiled and said, I know what it's like. In fact, you are very happy about the job I did in labor and delivery. <laughs> she looked puzzled. You liked him enough to marry him, I smiled. Then I told her the true story of how we moved to Alabama in the middle of a horrible storm on Friday the 13th and got our U-Haul truck stuck in the mud in front of the house that I had just bought sight unseen, a house that had 40 leaks in the roof. Judy was a full nine months pregnant, and baby number 11 was on the way. And I was just about to start law school the next week, 35 miles away. For a week, I, lurked, I worked like frantic trying to install a working tub, toilet, and sink, working to install water lines and a drain. Meanwhile, <laughs> we used a porta potty behind a screen. That means Judy, me, and 10 children, one of whom was less than two years old, and we washed up in a basin. Do you remember that I told you Judy never complained? but I had to start law school before I finished. And Judy was already overdue at this time, and I wasn't done with the bathroom yet. I was sure that the baby would be born while I was 35 miles away. To be safe, we had found a midwife who was willing to do a home birth, but she lived about 45 minutes from our house. And remember, this was in the days before cell phones. <laughs> that dates me, doesn't it? It's a long time ago. Even cordless phones were very rare in those days and only in homes of rich people. But I went through the first week of class and each evening came home where Judy was still patiently trying to unpack, trying to avoid leaks in the ceiling, trying to cook for 10 children and meet their needs. That Saturday after that first week, I crawled under the house and finished up the drain lines to the septic tank came inside and ran the water to make sure that there were no leaks and that the new water heater was working and especially that all the water ran downhill to the drain. And praise the Lord, it all worked. I walked out into the dining room where Judy was sewing. In the early days, she made much of our children's clothing. Hey, sweetheart, I said, come see the new bathroom I just finished. She walked through the door of the bathroom. Her water broke. She went into labor, and I delivered Isaiah 15 minutes later. <laughs> I was very glad that I had been in on the birth of the first 10 children. And so I was able to say to Melissa, you're very happy about the job that I did, because I delivered Isaiah. No midwife, no doctor, no nurse, but God was there. and a gracious, patient wife who didn't insist on going and sitting in a hospital for days and days because she had children to care for. She was a joyful mother of children, smiled and gave birth. When the midwife finally arrived, she had nothing to do but certify the birth for the state birth records, check to make sure I'd done everything right, and check to make sure that Judy was okay. Now, let me give you something else. Let me switch gears for just a little bit and give you another example of a joyful birth prophesied in Scripture. Did you know that both today and tomorrow are special birthdays, biblical birthdays? You have a congregation, or excuse me, you have a congratulations to Israel in your bulletins, and Keith read it to you this morning, because tomorrow, May 14th, marks the 70th anniversary of Israel's Declaration of Independence, 
When they became a sovereign nation in 1948, by the way, your bulletin is typed wrong. It says May 16th. It's May 14th. That should read May 14th. And tomorrow, to honor Israel, the United States will hold, this is amazing, will hold its official ribbon-cutting ceremony for our new embassy in Jerusalem. For the past 70 years, the United States has had its embassy in Tel Aviv, even though Jerusalem is, in fact, the capital of Israel. We've pussyfooted around for 70 years because of Arab and Muslim bullying and threats. But folks, the reality is that Jerusalem is, in fact, the capital of Israel. And you know something I am very glad that President Trump is not afraid to say so, regardless of what the Muslim bullies threaten to do. But today, the day before, is also another prophetic birthday in Israel as well. Today is Jerusalem Day, May 13th, the day that we're sitting in right now. You say, well, what in the world is that? Today celebrates the liberation and the reunification of the city of Jerusalem in the 1967 war, the Six-Day War it's known as. This is an exciting two days in the history of Israel. In fact, we are in the middle of a massive number of world remembrance events that are related to Israel and the history of the church. Over this past year, starting in 2017, think of all these events. Here are eight amazing events within the last year and a half. 2017 marked the 500 years since the Reformation. It's been 120 years since the first Zionist Congress. It's been 100 years, a double jubilee, since the Beersheba Charge of the Light Brigade. It's 100 years since the Balfour Declaration. It's the anniversary of the capture of Jerusalem by Gentile Christians. It's 70 years since the UN Partition Plan. It's 50 years jubilee since the capture of Jerusalem by Israeli Jews. It's 30 years since the beginning of the first Palestinian Intifada, which means the breaking of the yoke or horses shaking off the rider. That is eight incredible events that puts us on the cusp of history. There are birth pangs going on, people. That's what the Bible calls them. Do you get the sense that we're living in the last days, that we're seeing prophetic history unfold before our eyes as we're about to thrill to the greatest joy of all, the return of Christ for his bride, the church? The Bible says that the whole earth is in birth pangs, looking for the return of Christ. That is what Paul says, and he uses the vivid example of giving birth, which is full of pain, but results in joy. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. We're talking family, folks. We're talking mother, father, kids. Children, then heirs. Heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Now listen. Because now he's going to discuss the sufferings and what comes after them. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed. Going through the birth is painful. But there's incredible joy and glory on the other side of it. For the earnest expectation of the creature, that's the word for creation, waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature, that is the creation, was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Now listen. He's going to start using some childbirth words. Because the creature itself, that is the creation, also shall be delivered. That's what a woman does when she gives birth. From the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth, and here we have another word for, for childbirth, travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, do it, the redemption of our body. Yes, this place, this veil of tears, as it's called, is a place of suffering. The whole creation groans and travails in pain. That's a woman going through labor, experiencing the contractions, moving toward the transition, where suddenly there's no space between the contractions. One comes after another, comes after another, comes after another, and the woman is screaming for help. 
earth is moving toward that. Paul uses that same vivid picture of childbirth to describe the agony that will fall on the earth even as a woman cannot escape labor and delivery when her time comes, so the earth cannot escape the judgment of God, 1 Thessalonians 5.3. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. You ladies who've had babies know what it's like. You're working around the house one day and suddenly you go, ah, and you feel it. You straighten up and you take a breath. And you, I wonder if it's starting. A few minutes later, you go, ah, ah, you feel the next one. You call your husband, sweetie, I think I may be going into labor. He drops everything. He rushes home. He puts you in the car. He rushes to the hospital. I can remember rushing to the hospital in the middle of the night. We had a, a midwife, but we were delivering at hospitals up in North Jersey. And uh, we got to the corner where there was a light just before the hospital. And this was like at 3 o'clock in the morning. And there was a guy in front of me. And he was stopped at the corner. And I waited for a minute and the light didn't change. And I waited for And Judy's going <laughs> like this. And contraction, Joe. And I beeped the horn. And he didn't move. And I beeped the horn again. And he got out of his car. And just then the light turned, he got back in his car and he left, and I turned the corner, got to the emergency room, we got Judy on the gurney into the elevator, and she delivered on the elevator as we were up to going up to labor and delivery. <laughs> we had some exciting times, folks. We had some exciting times. Sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. You can't get out of it just like you can't get out of childbirth. Let me read you just one more passage where Paul quotes the Old Testament about a barren mother giving birth and being filled with joy, which is what we see in our psalm, Psalm 113.9. My little children, this is Galatians 4, beginning in verse 19, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Paul was expressing his pain that the Galatian Christians trying to see Christ formed in them like a child being formed in the womb of its mother until it is born. I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. Are you going to be born? Are you going to be born? Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. He of the free woman was of promise. And then we get down to verse 26. He's compared Jerusalem with Mount Sinai, and he says, but Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolation hath many, the desolate hath many more children than she which hath a husband. It's a beautiful picture, a mother giving birth and the incredible joy that follows, a joyful mother of children. Today is Mother's Day. It's not an ancient holiday. In fact, it's not even a worldwide holiday. In fact, it's not even a holiday celebrated by the rest of the English-speaking world, although some Americans have carried it abroad. It was first instituted in the United States in 1907, but was not recognized by Congress until 1914, a year of significant import leading up to the First World War. It's celebrated on the second Sunday in May, this year, May 13th. In 1914, when it was officially named a holiday by Congress, it fell just one month before the spark that ignited World War I. The Germans sank the Lusitania on May 7th, 1915 shortly before Mother's Day of that year, but President Woodrow Wilson refused to enter the war. By February 4th of 1917, when Germany declared an unlimited submarine campaign with the right to sink American ships and the deliberate sinking of U.S. merchant vessels, plus Germany's attempt to bring Mexico into the war against the United States, President Wilson could hesitate no longer. On April 16th, 1917, one month before Mother's Day, the United States entered the war with Germany. On November 14th, the Eastern forces under General Allenby took the city of Jaffa in Israel and turned inland to march on Jerusalem, which was held by the Muslim Turks. On December 9th, 1917, General Allenby got off his horse and walked through the gates of Jerusalem, declaring that the only conqueror who could enter that city on a horse was the Lord Jesus Christ himself. 
For the first time in 400 years, the city was no longer in Muslim hands. World War I is thus a major marker for Jerusalem, the mother of us all, as we read just a moment ago. American mothers had lost sons in other world wars, but not on the scale of loss experienced in World War I. It was in that war that American mothers first began to realize the massive loss of sons, husbands, fathers, grandsons. It was the mothers whose losses in the trenches of Europe came to the saddened attention of the American people and solidified the holiday in American love and thought. How did it happen? June 28, 1914. Austrian Archduke Francis Ferdinand was assassinated at Sarajevo. Exactly one month later, Austria-Hungary declared war against Serbia. Serbia appealed to its ally, Russia. The same day, July 29th, and the Imperial Council at Potsdam decided on war against Russia and as a corollary against France. On July 31st, Russia ordered a general mobilization and Germany, taking equivalent steps, sent a 12-hour ultimatum. By May, on August 1st, the state of war existed between Russia and Germany, and the next day, German troops entered French territory. At 7 p.m. that same day, Germany sent an ultimatum to Belgium, demanding unopposed passage. On August 3rd, Germany's formal declaration of war in France followed, and on August 4th, German troops crossed the Belgian frontier for the sanctity of which England stood as the guarantor. At midnight in reply, England also entered the war. Truly, Mother's Day was born on the eve before what was called the war to end all wars. We just read Galatians 4.26. That's the context of war. The context is the war between the flesh and the spirit, the struggle between law and grace. And there is a struggle going on. There are painful birth pangs, just as the world was going through birth pangs at the outset of World War I, just as there was a war between the nations in 1914 through 1918. So there is a war between the descendants of two mothers, the children of Abraham by Sarah, the children of Abraham by Hagar. And remember, I just told you, today is Jerusalem Day. Tomorrow is Israel's Independence Day. In the same way that there's a war between those of the free world and those of the dictatorial world, those who desire to be under the law of the Old Testament, those who desire to be under the grace of God. Remember what Paul wrote? My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Pain. But he closes with, but Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Jerusalem, the place where Christ was crucified, that's the pain. Fulfilling the law, breaking the bondage, the place where Jesus rose from the dead, that brings the incredible joy of the mother. The heavenly Jerusalem, where we shall live for all of eternity, filled with joy and peace as God's children, his born ones. Do you get it? those who have been born again. The birthing process is used as the illustration of how you and I enter into the, the heavenly kingdom of God. Do you understand a joyful mother of children? Do you see the incredible way that God uses birth to express not only pain, but to express the following joy? Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, where we'll each experience that unbounded joy that follows the sufferings of earth. Hear it in Revelation 3. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Jerusalem. 
the place of suffering, but deeply in the love of God. Jerusalem, the place where our Lord died and went through all of the pains that a mother suffers in childbirth. Jerusalem, the place that Jesus told his disciples the night before he died. You're going to have sorrow, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. Jerusalem, the mother of us all. Now do you understand why Psalm 119 verse 9 ends with the joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, Earth is filled with birth pangs, and they get closer and closer together the closer we get to the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're moving through the transition. We're moving through that time where there does not seem to be much space between each of the birth pangs as they hit. But you are there holding our hand. You are there comforting us. You are there telling us that you love us. You are there seeing us through the trials and the pain and the suffering. And very soon, our bridegroom is going to come for us and catch us up to meet him in the clouds. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. There will be no more suffering. There will be no more sorrow. There will be no more death. There will be no more travail and pain. For the former things are passed away. And he will wipe away all tears from our eyes. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Our closing hymn for this morning is hymn number 451, A Christian Home. We'll stand to sing all the verses. Hymn number 451.